Schwartz, who's there in the middle, and Susan in turn was the PhD mentor for Beth Archie, who's pictured there over on the left, and me. So um, baboons live together in social groups that are really structured by strong bonds between females. Female members, female members of the same family live together for their entire lives um, in, in um, groups that we call matrilines. And we are a little bit of an academic matriline um, ourselves. So I think that all of us have been, I mean, certainly Susan and Beth and I have been um, incredibly uh, blessed to have the example of Jean, who was an enormously successful and important woman in science um, working in the, the 70s and 80s when that wasn't very common. Um, and this is a little bit of a different image, but this is a really cool um, article online about Jean. That's, that's a cartoon picture of Jean up on the top as um, a member of the Justice League of Primatology. And in this um, completely uncommissioned piece that we had nothing to do with. We just found it. I think one of, someone in our labs found it one day and sent it to us. Um, uh, the author wrote something that I think is, is really apt. Um, Jean Altman, who fostered theretofore unheard of statistical rigor through her studies of baboon mother-infant interactions, changed field studies forever by her example. So um, I do not usually include this slide in talks, but I thought it was appropriate for this particular venue. OK, so what did she do? What are we doing? We're doing this kind of thing day to day. This is one of our long-term field assistants, Kenyo Awaratare, Awaratare, who's been working in, with us in Amboseli since 1995. And he's out there uh, with members of one of our study groups, writing down who's doing what with whom every single day, except for Sundays. And um, the baboons are very tolerant of our presence, as you can see here. Um, we don't feed them, and we also don't threaten them. And so they just let us watch them every day in a way that is very hard to do in humans, where I think few of us would be open to just letting someone follow us around every day and, and, and seeing what happens. So we do this with um, animals in our population from when they're born to when they die. And so uh, baboons live a long time, but not as long as humans, which means that we've been following them now. I think we just broke into our ninth generation of animals in Amboseli, descendants of the females that um, the gene started studying in 1971. OK, so one of the things that has been most striking about these observations is how important the early lives of baboons are to how they do down the road. On the left-hand side of the slide, I'm just listing some of the things that th we think are most important to the experience of infants and juveniles, kids in our population. Whether they are born to a high-status family, whether they have their moms throughout that infancy and juvenile period, whether their moms are actually well integrated into the social group, whether they're having to compete a lot in large groups with other animals, and whether they're born in a time of environmental hardship. This is a, um, a savanna environment that doesn't get much rain, so um, sometimes we hit years that make it look a lot like the desert southwest, and that's pretty hard on the animals um, in Amboseli. Those arrows connect those early life experiences to all kinds of things that different investigators in Amboseli have studied over time. So those early life factors influence when animals mature, what their stress hormone physiology is like, how many babies and how quickly individuals have babies when they, when they um, become adults themselves. So here we're talking about effects that separate early life from adulthood, sometimes by a decade or more. And yet there seems to be this long reach of early life experiences experience, which parallels actually much of what we know in humans. We were really inspired by some of our colleagues who study early life experiences in humans to ask about what happens when multiple types of adverse early experiences affect the same individual. So it's not uncommon to simply, in human focus studies, to simply add up major sources of early life adversity. And so we did that, and we found something really striking which is that the number of bad things that can happen to a baby baboon not only predicts things like you know, their hormone levels in adulthood, but also in a very profound way how long they too live. 
And so basically what I'm showing you here is a plot. Each line is for different sets of individuals in our population. So that dark blue line, those are, those are baby baboons that didn't have anything bad happen to them. They're the animals we think about as our silver spoon babies. And then if you go down each of those successive lines, those that's more and more early life adversity. Okay? The faster those lines drop, the quicker individuals in that category kind of die off after they reach uh, maturity. And so one way to just interpret that kind of plot um, in, in you know, one very striking statistic is that the difference between our silver spoon kids and the ones who just got hit over and over by tough early life events, three or more, the difference in expected lifespan is about 10 years. Okay, 10 years is a long time, even for humans. But if we do that sort of thing, you know how we talk about, let's see, um, one dog year is seven human years, right? That's right, right? Yeah, so one baboon year is about three human years. That's about the scale. So we're talking about something that we're thinking about our own species is a difference in like 30 years of life expectancy, even though what happened to these animals happened to them much earlier in life, okay? What we know is that animals who experience a lot of early life adversity also grow up to be more socially isolated from other animals in their group than animals who don't. And so that too is another potential route um, that, affect, that may affect how long they live. And in some beautiful work that was led by one of Susan Alberts' grad students recently, Matthew Zippel, um, we were able to show that this not only affects those females who experience um, early adversity themselves, potentially because their mothers die, but when they grow up and have their own offspring, those juveniles are less likely to make it to adulthood too. So this is a long-term effect of, um, of the environment that we think is largely mediated through relationships between moms and their offspring. Okay, so a natural question um, is about how this exactly is happening, right? Is there any reason to believe that, um, that social interactions somehow reach deeply into our bodies and into our cells to affect what's going on at that microscopic level. Um, this is uh, from an article written by the late, great um, Bruce McEwen, who is a real pioneer in thinking about the social determinants of health and um, uh, remarkably, remarkably broad in thinking about how studies of both humans and other animals um, could lend themselves to this big question. Okay? And that question is, how does this work? How does stress get under the skin to influence how we do, whether we're healthy, and how long we live? So um, we've been interested in asking that question by asking about how genes are regulated. Okay? And I'll just give you a brief introduction to what I mean by that by letting you look at this beautiful picture of um, white and purple flocks in the Duke Gardens. So this is part of our campus that's a particularly nice place to visit if you're ever up in North Carolina. So what's going on here is that you have flowers and they're either making a purple color or they're not making a purple color. And the way that works is because those genes that can produce a purple color are in all of these plants' genomes, okay? And they're encoded in our DNA sequence, which doesn't change across the lifetime of, our in, of an individual. So we have the same genome now as we did when, um, when our genome first formed um, as a zygote in, in our mother's bodies. That DNA sequence, though, um, is the template for producing um, the recipe for the actual proteins that, in this case, produce purple pigment or not. Okay? And so the way we get this kind of phenotypic variation that you see, purple flowers, white flowers, is not necessarily a difference in the sequence itself, that's the same, but a difference in whether that sequence is turned on or off, and if it's turned on, whether it's turned up or turned down, right? 
all of the pieces of our bodies, our eye cells and our toenail cells and our liver cells, have the same genome. The reason they're so different from one another is because of differences in when DNA sequence is turned on or off or up or down. Okay, so here we have a case where that variation produces differences in color, but um, our genomes are also responsive to our environments. And so one question we wanted to ask is whether social environments, our interactions with others, or in, in this case, um, monkeys' interactions with the others, did the same kind of thing, actually played around with the tuning of our genes up or down, on or off. And there's a lot of precedent to think so, right? These guys, bees, wasps, ants, um, often live in social structures where an animal can have the same genome but can become a queen or can become a worker and have major differences in body size or longevity and hormonal levels even though we're talking about the same genome, right? So now we're asking, well, does this carry over to the subtle relationships that we have with one another from day to day that either make or break our day? Okay, so for this work, we've primarily been studying um, this other charismatic non-human primate. These are rhesus macaques. Um, rhesus macaques are very social. They always live in groups, and they form really clear social hierarchies. You put a bunch of rhesus macaques together, and they will form a status ladder. That's part of um, the way that they've evolved. I've been studying th um, these guys for some time um, in collaboration with Mark Wilson and Vas Mishopoulos, who are at Emory University in Atlanta, and with Luis Barrero, um, who is an evolutionary geneticist at University of Chicago. Okay, why are these a good uh, species to study? If you want to ask about social, how social environments influence our genomes, well, it's because we can actually do manipulations of the social environment that are impossible to do in humans. So we cannot take this room and then just sort of close our eyes and draw, you know, um, numbers from a jar and reassign income or educational status or job status to each other. Right? I mean, maybe we could, but probably none of you would volunteer for that study. <laughs> okay, so that's never been done in humans for good reason. But we can do that with rhesus macaques. So if we take adult female rhesus macaques and we put them together into a new social group because they're so hierarchical, they'll form a new status hierarchy. And it turns out that individuals who we put into groups first become the highest ranking individuals. And individuals who go in after that become serially lower ranking. Okay? So we can largely do that sort of gold standard experiment, right? the sort of classical scientific method thing where we kind of randomize the variable that we're interested in and then ask, well, what happens? We replicate this kind of thing across nine or ten different social groups and then we watch what happens to those animals for about a year or so to really ask whether it's actually the social environment per se that's causing the outcomes we're interested in, we do a secondary um, manipulation where we take all the top-ranking females who are at the top of their social hierarchy ladders and we put them together. And then we put all the betas together and all the gammas together, and because these are really hierarchical animals, they reform a new status hierarchy. And so by doing that, we can watch individuals when they were high ranking and when they were low ranking, when they were low ranking and then high ranking, and then some individuals when they sort of stayed at a consistently high or consistently low rank throughout the several years of the study. So I just want to give you a flavor for what that looks like. So on, on the bottom here, I'm just showing you time. I'm going to show you time going by. And on the y-axis, on the vertical axis, I'm showing you differences in dominance rank and social status. And the way we measure dominance rank here is actually something that we pulled from um, uh, other parts of, of uh, other domains of life. So um, if you're familiar with how chess players are ranked when they play each other, or tennis rankings, or badminton rankings, or World of Warcraft rankings, any of those things, that's what we're doing with these animals. We're watching who wins and loses every time they interact with each other. So each line is a different female. We're putting them together one by one. They sort of figure each other out, and very rapidly they land into a hierarchy that then just stays stable over the next year or so. Okay. All right. So what do we find? Well, one thing we find 
is that being high or low status, right, being assigned in this experiment to high or low status, um, changes the way that females socialize with one another and changes how quickly they can recover from um, models of stressful experiences. Okay? And that changing them again, moving an animal from high ranking to low ranking or vice versa, changes their behavior in turn. So here, I think we're getting very clear evidence that where these females fall in that ladder is the cause of a lot of the way they respond to other individuals and not vice versa. Okay. I said we were particularly interested in whether these kinds of experiences can kind of reach deeply into our cells and, and change what our genes are doing. And so one of the ways we've asked that question is, is just to do a little bit experiment with blood that we can draw from our animals. So we draw blood into little tubes. And those tubes basically contain cell food, what we call cell culture media. And one of those tubes uh, just, has, just has the media in it, nothing else. And another tube that we draw at the same time has the media, and it also has a compound that mimics um, infection by bacteria. So the cells from our animals think that they're seeing bacterial infections, and the compound we use is uh, something that, you know, if injected into any one of us, would also lead to a pretty strong response, right? These cells think that they're under attack. We then just keep them at body temperature for, for about four hours. And then we ask about what's going on with their genes. How are they changing um, the regulation of their genome in response to being high or low status? And what we find is that low status females always seem to turn up inflammation